Thank you, Noreen. I realize I'm not sure I identified who I am. My name is Sue Ellen Lugers, and I'm a member here at New Market Community Church. I'm also a retired American Baptist pastor. And even though I did this for 25 years, every time I do it now, it's just as if it's the first time all over again. But I'm very glad to see you and all of you at home. And, and uh, I think we should turn around and all wave to Pastor Patty because I'm sure she's watching. And we pray that you are well soon. Thank you. So today, um, we're starting, uh, the plan was to start a new six-week series and um, talking about the family table, the place we all belong. And today, we're combining a couple of the themes. The first two are God's heart of welcome and radical inclusion. And we'll be looking at these themes through um, the coming weeks, and they are um, I See You, Whatever It Takes, No Longer Strangers, Better Together, The Way of Love. But as I said, we're starting today with God's Heart of Welcome, and our welcome of others flows from God's heart. And it is for all people. And we know that all of us here and at home, we, we have been welcomed by God. And we know that his heart is so big to take in all of us and all of us in the world. And he calls us into a relationship with him. And that then means that we are to be in relationships with one another, with people of all ages all abilities, all ethnicities, we should all be together around the table. And then the th second theme will be radical inclusions, inclusion. And we know that we as a church here practice radical inclusion. We want everyone to come and to worship with us and to be a part of us. And today, these verses challenge our view of God's kingdom and who will be at that messianic banquet that Noreen read about in Luke. We extend the grace of welcome to all people who cannot reciprocate because that is what God has done for us. So Noreen read this passage from Luke. It's probably one of the passages that causes a lot of, I would say, friction and argument um, if you liken this banquet to a church in that, you know, he's telling the, the man, the master told his servants, go out and bring in all these people. As she read, not the rich, not your friends, bring in those that are unloved and unwelcome. But if we really want to understand this passage, we have to look at this parable in light of the customs of that day. And typically, people received two invitations to a celebration. One would be um, a nonspecific invitation that would go to the guest announcing the event highlighting its significance, and pretty much um, like what we get today in Save the Date. And just this week, I got a Save the Date um, invitation for the wedding of my great-nephew in Vermont in, o in October. I better remember the day he asked me to do the wedding. Um, so they would get one invitation like that, and they did that because planning in those days was so unpredictable. It wasn't like us who can go down to the corner grocery and get what we need. 
Uh, they may have had to wait for a cow to really fatten up in order to be able to have that um, part of the banquet or some other things that needed to become available. So they sent out the first invitation without a day or time stipulated. But then the anticipation of getting that second invitation. The feast is ready. It's time to party. And those invited never quite knew when that second message would be delivered, but they were prepared to go as soon as the invitation was extended. This banquet that Jesus was referring to was a big deal. It was a great banquet, a big-time feast. Think about the banquets that we might go to today. We go at 7, we're home by 9. Probably depends on your age, but, you know. <laughs> but, but in those days, the people came early, and they stayed until all the food was gone and all the partying was done. And by then, probably their energy had run out. They were huge celebrations. And it was an event that people looked forward to attending. Well, most people. If you heard in the scripture, there were several people who excused themselves from the party. Now, we've all made excuses for various things. Perhaps some celebration, you're like, oh, I really don't have time. I don't want to go to that. And we know that that happens if we're having the same party ourselves. Sometimes our excuses are elaborate, and they might have very little truth to them. And that's what's happening here today. And they began to make excuses. The first person said, I just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. And another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Now, these might seem logical, but if we look a little deeper, the first one said, I've just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Now, how many people buy any piece of land unseen? No, if you're going to buy land, you want to go and you want to walk around it and just check out all the various bumps and things like that that might be part of it. So that excuse really was not realistic. The next guy said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I want to try them out. Well, that's like someone today buying five John Deere tractors. If you're going to buy a tractor, you want to go around and kick the tires and test drive it. Before anyone buys a yoke of oxen, he's going to check them out first because he wants to see if they're strong enough for the job. So the servant came back and reported this to the master. Okay, if they're going to make excuses, then he said in anger, go out into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Jesus is teaching us that God has a heart for hurting people. He specifically mentions the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And when we see this, we automatically think about groups of people. But I believe that God's heart is bigger than we can imagine. When Jesus refers to those who are poor, could that also include those individuals who are poor in spirit? People who are depressed and discouraged. This parable is saying that God has a place for people whose lives are broken and hurting. There's room for people who are not perfect. What about the crippled? We normally think of a person who's crippled as individuals who cannot walk. 
But there are times in our lives when we are crippled by life. Some of us here today have probably been crippled by something that has happened to us. Maybe a setback, a divorce, an unexpected death of a loved one. It is my hope that we as a church can help you find comfort in Christ and that we can grieve together with you and walk alongside of you. You don't have to do it alone. What about the blind? We think of blind people as individuals who are sight impaired. But again, we know the Bible talks about people who are spiritually blind, who are blinded by the world and cannot see the light of God's love. And the lame, people who have never been given a chance to walk, for whatever reason, they, they can't simply get on their feet. They need help so they can get up and get on a new path. Maybe some of you feel like that today. You feel like you can't get ahead. You feel as though you can't break through. Well, it is my belief through a lot of years of being with people in good times and in bad, that God has a place for you and that he will bring you through whatever challenges you are facing. In verse 22, the servant says to the master, what you ordered has been done. We went out and we got the poor, the blind, the lame, but there's still room. God is bigger than we think he is. His heart is bigger. His compassion is bigger. His plans for you and for me are bigger than we can imagine. And perhaps you may think, I ask God all the time for answers. I, I think I ask him too much. And he says, there's more. There is still room. This story does teach us about the heart of God. He loves people who have lost their way and people who are broken. You can't watch a good movie without telling 10 of your friends how good it was. And you don't go to a good restaurant without referring to it and telling your friends about it. But how often do we share the story of how God has blessed our lives? Don't be timid. Tell your story. Tell your friends what it feels like for you to have a relationship in God through Christ. Now, your friends aren't looking for a lesson in theology. They're looking for hope. And when you talk to them, which I think sometimes I know I particularly don't talk down to them. Don't preach to them. Don't judge them. Just love them enough to share the good news and tell your story. Jesus is telling us to go. He said, make them come in. We need to be proactive. We need to take the initiative. But here's a problem. We like empty seats. We like empty seats at a movie theater. And we definitely like empty seats if we're flying on an airplane. You pray for an empty seat next to you because it gives you more room and you can spread out. A few months ago, I went on a pilgrimage to Greece and I knew there was a long flight on a big plane over and a long flight on a big plane back. But I will tell you, in true honesty, I started praying that those planes would not be full. And you know what? They were not. 
people have yet to really get back into flying to Europe. And because I was part of a group, we had the whole back end to ourselves in both directions. I had two seats to myself. I was so thankful. And I'm sure there's many of you who feel that way too. But I want to remind us that empty seats in church are a different matter and a serious matter because every empty seat represents someone who is missing. Every empty chair represents a life that God can't touch in this church service. Now, true, that probably was way more uh, a problem before the pandemic, because now we do have our live stream. But something about being here, and it represents maybe some, someone who doesn't quite feel that their burdens can be lifted and their heart can't be mended. We pray that these empty seats will be filled with people who are looking to know that God loves them, who are trying to navigate this life, and maybe they're trying to do it without the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. These people are our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, and many of them are carrying unbelievably heavy burdens, and they do not know that there is a better way to live. The master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. There's a lot of talk, has been for many years, about church growth. And we can't have that be our whole focus. But when we are what the church is called to be, hopefully then we will see people come in and find what they need to live their life. I want to close with an um, illustration. You might find it kind of interesting, but it was written by two, um, shared by two men, Keith Miller and Bruce Larson, in a book called The Edge of Adventure. And I will tell you that this book is probably um, at least 50 years old, but it is a book early in my ministry that I found such practical uh, advice and examples of how we as the church should be. So this is what they say. The neighborhood bar is possibly the best counterfeit there is to the fellowship Christ wants to give his church. It's an imitation dispensing liquor instead of grace, escape rather than reality, but it is a permissive, accepting, and inclusive fellowship. It is unshockable. It is democratic. You can tell people secrets, and they usually don't tell others or even want to. The bar flourishes not because most people are alcoholics, but because God has put into the human heart the de desire to know and be known, to love and be loved, and so many seek a counterfeit at the price of a few beers. They go on to say, with all my heart, I believe that Christ wants his church to be unshockable, democratic, permissive. A fellowship where people can come in and say, I'm sunk, I'm beat, I've had it. Too often our churches miss it. And by being a welcoming church full of God's love and with his heart and also practicing radical inclusions, it is my hope and prayer 
that we as New Market Community Church will not miss the opportunity. Amen.